What's up, everyone? I'm Scott. And I'm Jason. And you are listening to Liquid Carnage. <sighs> my friend, uh, in my better half league, fantasy football, um, I have I, I beat her last week. I know it was a cliffhanger. Um, I held on to beat her. It was a very close game last Monday night. Uh, I So I jumped her in the standings. I jumped our EP, Tom. I'm only trailing you in that league. So uh, the world is getting right yeah. in fantasy football. Yes, uh, at least that league I'm doing I'm doing well. In fact, this week I think I, I might be a top scorer in this this week as well. I had a great week in that league. Um, I did finally get a victory in our keeper league. Finally, took me a long time, but I finally got a, a win in the keeper league. I I beat the uh, the intern. So, oh yeah, I uh, I lost to him on a fluke two weeks ago last week. I don't remember. I, I beat our newest uh, member of that league this year. Uh, our buddy Los, uh, who drafted drunk and it shows, uh, Christian McCaffrey single handedly beat his team. So, <laughs> wow, yeah, that's that's brutal. That's brutal. Very, very happy with that. Very happy with that. So, you know, that's cruising along. So, I have to say, I, I did some traveling last week for work. I'm doing some traveling next week for work. And you know, as you're driving down the roads in a car by yourself early in the morning, late at night, you know. You don't have to listen to just music or talk radio anymore. Thank God for audiobooks and podcasts. Oh yeah, you know? yeah, totally. And I, I, I had to go to a recruiting fair last week. Part of what I do now is I, I recruit physicians, and I was down in your neck of the woods at the Mayo Clinic. And well, first off, what a beautiful facility. Oh, it's getting uh, better and, too. It's getting really yeah. nice. And and the hospital food down there, which which they served us, was amazing. Uh, they had the steak skewers. Uh, with a chimichurri sauce. Now, I'm not sure if you know what a chimichurri sauce is, uh, but for our listeners out there that don't, um, it's basically uh, chopped parsley, red wine vinegar, garlic, olive oil, a little bit of salt and red pepper flakes, all pureed in a, in a, in a food processor, and, and you let it sit, and you dip your, your steak bites in it, and it's pretty freaking amazing. And that's at the at the hospital cafeteria. Wow. They, 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 I don't know if it's in the cafeteria, but that, that's what they made for for the recruiting fair to attract some of the doctors uh, to come and and, and speak to us. Uh, so I had to come home this weekend and make my own chimichurri sauce. And I am 42 years old, and I was raised on a lot of things. And my my parents never probably they probably still don't know what chimichurri sauce is or chimichurri is. Uh, but I for now, I for one, from now on. We'll make sure that's on. That's an option for every steak I ever make ever again. Wow, that good, huh? I really enjoy it. it it's it's the garlic and the lemon zest and 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 the parsley and the red wine. It all just works really well with, with beef. It's 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 a it's a, uh, it's a very Argentinian way to eat your steak. Oh, beautiful, wonderful. Yeah. Um. But yeah, along the way though, like I mentioned, you driving the roads. I was it was suggested for me uh, to check out. An audio book, a biography, uh, the biography of Matthew McConaughey uh, called Green Light. And I kind of took a step back for a minute because I don't normally listen to biographies, especially actors biographies. <laughs> uh, but I've always enjoyed Matthew McConaughey. I think he's fun. I mean, he, he picks fun roles. He picks good roles. And he narrates the book. And I, I have to tell you. It's the story of his life and how he's he's chosen to live his life. And green light is a great way to call it because he lives his life by red light, yellow light, green light. If you get a green light, you go. If you get a yellow light, you just work the problem until it turns to a green light, and then you go, and so on and so forth. So he just talked about his life experiences, how he got into acting, um, and I'm about halfway through right now. But it's it's a very neat story, and to hear how a man like that has lived his life. Uh, first off, getting arrested for you know smoking weed and banging on the bongos is just the tip of the iceberg. Interesting. Uh, wow. Uh, but, but like how he got involved with Days and Confused, and how the very first lines he ever said on set are now the three most iconic words uh, ever to come from him. Yeah. Right. Exactly. I, exactly. Exactly. How that you know, changed I mean, that one moment changed his life, basically. Yeah, it really did. And just like everything and just like the, the go for it guts and glory. And it, it's it's very cool just just to see, like, you know, even the most mundane things, how we made it work for him, how he made the best of it and how he dealt with it. And I think it's just the perspective of 
how how somebody else dealt with a similar like similar problems in life because even as we grow for as different as everyone's lives are we all still run into very similar um you know situations you know so hearing other perspectives really helps that that's that's kind of interesting i i've been going through a an exercise myself i i my, my mother invited me up for labor day uh weekend to help kind of clear out some of my dad's belongings he, they've been sitting in her garage for 12 uh, like seven years and we thought let's you know maybe it's time we need just need to go in you know, take a look, see what's there. Well, one of the boxes that was there was um, my dad did um, there. There's a like a stationary book called Day at a Glance. And Day uh -huh. at a Glance is basically a yearly book, a, a ringed book that has every day broken up in 15 minute intervals. Mm -hmm. And you basically I think you use it kind of as an organizer to, you know, say I've got a meeting this time. You know, I'm going to talk to these people. Well, he, I have 40 years of these books that my dad recorded from 1975 until his death in 2015. And okay. I, I've been toying with the idea of writing a story, like a biography of his life, uh, because, you know, now I know I'm partial because I'm his son, but I always thought his life was a pretty fascinating story. And so yeah. I thought, well, this would be a, give me a kind of a perspective of yeah. his life and um and give me some you know things that maybe I didn't know about my dad kind of similar to what you were talking about with you know listening to Matthew McConaughey you know mm -hmm. you, there's might be things that you learned about Matthew McConaughey that you had no idea right yeah. so I've been reading these books and I've been just absolutely fascinated some of the the things that he has identified with um every day most of the pages have just daily activities like ran to the store, went for a walk, got groceries, did this and this. And then all of a sudden he'll have kind of a, a bigger thing that he did in his life. Some yeah. of the things were amazing. Some of the things were maybe a little ethically or morally questionable. Um, and it got me thinking to, you know, we all have, like you said it best, even though our stories are different, the fundamentals of our lives having ups and downs and things we're proud of and things that we wish we hadn't done, all of us share that. And when you find out with someone's things they regret or things that may have been morally questionable, you it only is natural to take a pause and say, does that make him a good person or a bad person? Yeah. And I, you know, I, I was trying to I, I posed the question to Noreen. I said, do you think you're that you would say that your dad was a good dad? You know, putting a label on Noreen's father or my father or I guess in, in this discussion on your father, you know, mm -hmm. are they a good dad? Were they a good dad? Um, because, like you said, some things we're proud of as people, some things we're we regret. Um, yeah. So I don't know if there's a standard of what makes a good father, what makes a bad father. Well, I, I think it's life experience. And, and when you get those experiences um, and how you apply them to your life, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine at, at work and and they were talking about going through the day to day of, of being in a marriage and how she and her husband had had a conflict. Well, he made a statement a few months ago that kind of stuck in the back of her head. And she had, she and some friends went through a, a, a life changing experience a few weeks ago that, that I guess brought her to a new level of maturity. When the conversation came up, she was able to circle back to that comment he made. And she, she was telling me she handled it very well, uh, based on the experiences she had from the time they had the initial conversation to now she goes had had we had the had i asked him about that right away she goes i'd have lost my shit i would not have handled you know his off comment which to him was nothing but it meant something to me and i needed the experience to temper my expectation and 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 temper my understanding so i i think that that goes a lot with what you're talking about here it's what makes a good father is the the ability to temper expectations grow and evolve well and you know one of the things i wonder though is 
is it possible that a good father for me may not be a good father for you or for someone else? Oh, absolutely. So, so, I mean, how much of the relationship is what makes a good father is the child's interaction with that? Well, I I think it's the interaction. I think it's, I think it's, I think it's so much more to it. I think it's about being present. And, and that's one thing I think the EP and I got very lucky with is our parents were both very present for, for being in the jobs that they had in the highway patrol and in the emergency room at the hospital. They were, they had to be, you know, gone a lot. But my dad never missed a Cub Scout or Boy Scout meeting if he didn't have to. He tried to make every camping trip, every baseball game, soccer game. If it was important, he was there. If it was practice, he would get us there. If not, our grandparents would take us. And I think that that resonates more because I think just being present, I think it helps shape, you know, a lot of the relationship, you know. Well, being present in a positive way. I'm sure there's a yeah, lot of people yeah. who wish their parent was not present all the time because of the bad things that they did uh, yeah. during a child's life. So, you know, a positive impact plays a, a an important part as well. Yeah, and, and I think that I think that's that's also another good way to put it. Just because just you're always there doesn't mean it's good that you're around. Right. I yeah. think if you if you don't have any kind of grace or or reasoning for your presence in there it can be a little off-putting and maybe detrimental to the development of, of the youth yeah i mean I, I i i don't know if our listeners know but i i have kind of weird estranged relationships with my children uh one of them was a child that i i really didn't even know about i it, it happened in college and i didn't find out till years later that i even had a, a daughter and then my son, um, I've been estranged from my son probably for 10 years. Um, and I, I think I self beat myself up that I was a bad father, right? I, I wasn't yeah. present. And, you know, I, I have very good friends that said, you know, Jason, you can't beat yourself up if you weren't given an opportunity to be present. Um, That's fair. Um, but, I know from from I'm sure from at least one of my child's perspectives, uh, you know, that lack of presence uh, means that you're defined. I'm defined as a bad father, which, you know, I we can debate. But you're I mean, that presence does make a difference, especially like you said, a positive one like your parents. You recognize they couldn't always be there for your events. But when they were could be there, they were there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of that too, you know, of what makes a good parent is also, I think under like, and this happens as you get older. So maybe uh, your kids will get this as they get older. Um, you're not perfect. Nobody's perfect. Parents are just as fallible as they are, as 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 kids are, and we all make mistakes. And it's not how you start; it's how you finish. So, you know, to me, it's it's never too late to have that good relationship. But you both got to want to work toward it, you know? Yeah. And, and I mean, and I only say that because my daughter got married last weekend and she invited me to the wedding. I saw my daughter's mother, who I hadn't seen in 32 years. Yeah. Um, and her her daughter, her, da- or her mother was gracious, was accepting of me and Noreen, was, I mean, truly like – no, there are no anima. There's no animosity. There are no hard feelings. I'm so glad that you, you know, got to be a part of uh, your daughter's life because she speaks highly of you. And I'm thinking now, wait a minute. Here's a girl who never knew her father for the first 18 years of her life, and yeah. she made a point to expound on a relationship that really she didn't have to. Yeah. I mean, you know, she didn't have to do that, and. You're right. It does depend kind of on how the child sees it, interacts with it. You know, people make mistakes. People do things that they, you know, aren't proud of and that were not perfect. Uh, but if I'm perfect for her, then that's most important. That's what matters. That's what, that's what matters, you know. And, yeah. you know, not everybody – there's no perfect situation. There's no perfect scenario. There's no, you know, open the box from the store and here's the perfect parent, perfect child. You know, everybody's fallible. Everything takes work and you have to be willing to 
to make the adjustments on the fly. And I, yeah, I mean, and I, I think one of the things that I've really enjoyed about this, this, you know, tr- this trip I've been going down through history of my dad is, um, recognizing that he had hopes and dreams that were, you know, smashed or things that he wanted to have happen that never did. And, and he was doing, you know, he was going through the struggles, you know, how often do you hear, Oh, my dad's my hero. You know, well, why is he your hero? He's just my hero. It's, it's almost like an emotional attachment of, yeah. of, of someone. And this has given me an opportunity of, I respect my dad in a lot of ways. And now I'm reading little things that are coming through his journals that you can tell, Oh, he had his dreams crushed. He had negative things happen in his life. He had demons that he had to deal with on a daily basis, just like the rest of us. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's always interesting to hear that side of your parents too. Cause my dad tried very hard, uh, for my brother and I not to find out a lot of the stories about his time in the highway patrol, working undercover, um, working narcotics, things like that. Because, you know, he, he wanted to protect us from, from that side. And when he retired, we were adults and we started hearing the stories, especially at his retirement party. And I remember looking at my brother, I was like, you really, dad was kind of a badass. Because you look at him, and he's just kind of those ho-hum, aw shucks kind of guys. But then you hear stories about starting, you know, brawls and strip clubs in Phoenix and, you know, handing people a shotgun, saying if it's not me, uh, walking out first, shoot them. You hear stories like that, and you think, fuck. Huh. Yeah. I never knew he had it in him. Like, yeah. does mom know these things? Yeah. You know? I mean, and and it, it, I think that's a big part of it, too. If you found out something bad about your dad now, uh huh. chances are it would not change your view, but it would add a little bit of color or clarity to the view of your father. Context. True, yes. or, or, true or false on that? Yeah, I think you're right. I don't think it changes the relationship. I mean, it most likely doesn't change the relationship, but, you know, like, all right, that, that adds clarity, more context to everything, and maybe some more understanding. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, I, 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 I've been writing letters to people in my life and I wrote a letter to Noreen recently and I was saying, you know, someone asked me once what I hate about Trump, what I hate about Trump. And I tried to come up with some, well, I don't like his policies. I don't like that he lies or whatever. And going through this, I kind of played that conversation back in my head and I realized, I think the, the simple explanation of why I don't like Trump is that he brings out the worst characteristics and qualities in me that I am instantly, um, anger, hatred, loathing of someone, wishing someone ill. Those aren't characteristics that I want in me, right? I try to keep those yeah. held down. And when someone brings those out just because of their natural tendency as a person, that's what I just don't like. Um, you know, and, and like my dad, I can read things that I don't like about him, but I can take them in a context that if I had known about them 15 years ago, would it have changed my relationship with him? I don't know. You know, I don't know. And that's, I, 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 that's why I wonder is like, what makes a good parent? What makes a good person? Because I, I found out a couple things that are not his best qualities as a man. Yeah. You know what I mean? And if I had known those when I was 10 or 11 versus as a 51 year old, maybe I would have thought differently about him. I don't know. Yeah. yeah and that's the hard part. It's you can't you can't look at it from that perspective. Like, well, a 10 year old me have understood that okay. uh, because at that age, you, you still look up. Your, your parents are still invincible. You know, they are. You know, the end all be all greatest parts like you just look up to them and i and I know that because there there's two children in our house that just adore you know their parents, and well, one does, and one's now a preteen, so she doesn't adore anybody but her phone but <laughs> yeah, I mean it does change a little bit, I got you it changes a little bit, but you, she's becoming more self-aware and more aware of how how she interacts with both her parents and like with their viewpoints versus her viewpoints. So she's starting to stand on her own a little bit 
and, and like be more thoughtful with what she wants and, and if it's okay for, you know, if it aligns with them or if it doesn't align with their thoughts. So it's very interesting to watch. Well, and, and you and I have both been to one, I'm sure in our lives, or you've heard of one. I don't care what a person does, bad, good. When there's a funeral for their funeral, invariably good gets said about them at their funeral. Yeah. Like yeah. Richard Nixon died and the people that came out were willing to let go of the, the known crimes that he committed and known things that he did that kind of made him kind of a shady person and focused only on the positive. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so I know that it's, we're capable of, of that, like, you know, looking at the positive in someone um, and, and, you know, it, that might change over time, but at the end of their life, we can look at the positive in them. So I, I know we're capable of doing it. I'm just always amazed when I hear someone say, oh, my parents are my heroes. You know, I, everything I, I owe, I owe it to my parents. And it's like, wow, that I mean, that is a pretty nice remembrance for someone that chances are, if they're like most parents, they're flawed. Oh, yeah. They're all flawed. All, all of us are. Yeah. I mean, all of us. It doesn't matter if you're a parent or not. We're all flawed individuals and we've all done things that we're not proud of or we are proud of. How do we get past the, the things we're not proud of in a life so that people remember us in a positive light? And, you know, and, and I think it's it's funny. You talk about the funeral like that and you talk about how people say nice things at the funeral versus the, the ugly things. And. Funerals inevitably bring out emotions. The, the, the emotion of sadness, I'm never going to see that person again. What was the last thing I said to them? Uh, and it, it's like when you go through a breakup. You ever been in an on-again, off-again with somebody, and when when you break up with them, you're mad at them, and, and you can't stand to be around them or the thought of them, and a couple of days pass, and you start to miss them, and then all the things you're mad about start to go away, and you start glorifying all of the things you think were good versus what they actually are. And yeah. that's the end of the reason you go back to them. I think funerals are very similar. But at that moment in time, you're just saying something nice about someone. And I think it's to make yourself feel better uh, about the situation as well as, you know, how you're going to remember them, whether it was a positive interaction or not. Yeah, I mean, I'm very fortunate that in my life I've never had someone who is so patently uh, evil or wrong that I I purely say if I never saw that person again uh, or if something bad happened to them, I would be like indifferent to it. Yeah. And, and I've had bad things happen to me. So don't get me wrong. I mean, I've had bad things happen to me, but there's no one that I would say, man, I want ill to that person. I want the worst things in the world happen to that person. Um, yeah. You know, cause I think when you, start, you start wishing that kind of that kind of ill will toward anybody. Uh, hate's still a very strong emotion. And I think when you have. When you, when you have that kind of emotion pointed at someone, you're not over it. I think when you become indifferent, that's the real sign of being over that person and just, yeah, man, it's whatever. Good for them. I feel bad for them. I hope they find, I hope they find their way, you know? Yeah. I used to beat myself up thinking that I was the only person that didn't have a close relationship with my kids. Uh, and over the years, I've realized there's a lot of families that have, issues, problems with parents and children not bonding or sisters and brothers not, you know, coordinating. So I, I've had to let go of some of my guilt on, you know, estrangement. And, you know, I, I feel like I'm alone in this. And, you know, I'm the only one that's going through an estranged relationship with a child. It happens all the time. Yeah. And, yeah. and you know, and w what – what determines what someone's value is, is a subjective opinion, right? I mean, yep. you know, like I'm, I'm sure that some people would look at my father and not deem him as a good father, yeah. right? Um, because of their own interpretation of that. Um, I think he's a wonderful father for me and I, I really miss him and I, I respected him and, and these little things that I've learned through reading his journals, frankly, are not so much of a deal breaker for me where I'd say, Oh my gosh, you know, I'm done. I'm done. Yeah. Uh, yeah the thing but, is though, either just cause you've read the journal, it doesn't change what he did for you, what he did with you, what you learned from him. 
Those things don't change just because you get more context. Yeah, I have more context of his life. I, it, nothing has changed. It, no, there's been nothing in there that's changed. He loved me as his son, and he thought about me a lot, and he tried to treat me as much of an adult as possible, even when I was in my younger age. Uh, you know, he, he, he treated me respectfully and fairly and, and loved me. Nothing on that part has changed. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Which maybe that's all it's important as long as that doesn't change everything else. I mean, I'm sure that there are some families that are totally heartbroken when they find out that, you know, the father or the mother is stealing from the kids funds to go buy drugs or, you know, th that that kind of stuff, I'm sure, is very difficult. Yeah. You know, and, um, you know, frankly, I respect some of these kids that like their father goes to prison. And are away for a long time and the kid still wants to have a relationship with the parent. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, like something must be built strong to be able to do that. That supersedes his crime against someone else. Right. Well, I think at the end of the day, it's still your, your blood. It's still your family. It's still the person who raised you or helped raise you. So, you know, the love is there. And just cause you know, they, they're behind bars in jail. <clears throat> doesn't yeah. mean some people can't have that relationship. It just takes more work on your part. And I think effort goes a long way on both sides. Um, now, I'm an only child of only children parents, but you have uh -huh. a brother. Do you find yeah. that as you and your brother have gotten older that the relationship has has changed or has gotten stronger, gotten different? What, 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 what would you say? I mean, EP is listening, so you don't have to say everything. But do you <laughs> find that as you guys have gotten older – um, some of those pieces of the picture have filled in or been colored a little bit now that you know more about yeah. each other. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, as we've gotten older, it's, it's interesting because your family, and we've always said you choose your family um, when you get to be adults, blood doesn't mean family, but it, it always does. And you know, to a certain extent, and it, it's been cool getting older because as we've both gotten older, you know, we're, we're both very different people, but we have a lot of things in common. You know, if we both walked in a room right now, unless you knew us, I don't think you'd think we're brothers. But if you spent five to ten minutes talking to us, you would see the similarities very quickly. Oh, I get. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know Tom as well as 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 I'd like, but I do know him well enough to know that, yeah, you guys have a lot of the same idiosyncrasies. Yeah. So it's, it's one of those like, yeah, it, it's cool because someone gets it because. You're basically in a foxhole with somebody for 18 years in, in the war of growing up. And nobody else is going to understand the shit that's being lobbed over you except for the person that was going through it next to you. You know, he might have been a little bit ahead because he's two years older, but that doesn't mean that we weren't dealing with the same things, you know? So it's it's been cool. And as we've gotten older and, and evolved and grown, I, I think our personalities complement the other uh, very well because it adds balance and context to the rest of our life. Uh, and it gives us another set of eyes at things that we might look at differently. Make sense? It does. And, and I, I also think too, that there's very few people that have a working history of you. Yeah. As long as Tom has had a working history of you, like he's known you your entire life. Um, my Denver Dean and my friend Pete, I mean, He's the long, I've known him now 35 years. He knows my history more than almost anybody else alive. Yeah. Uh, so having a reference, you know, having a kind of friendship like that or a relationship like that where you can know someone who knows you for as long as you guys have known each other and I've known Pete, um, there's something very special about that that, you know, even Noreen, Noreen, unfortunately, will never know me as long as my mom and Pete will know have known me. And yeah. they have the reference to that history that I have to tell her. And my dad told me through these journals, which I've been I've been just cherishing the reading because it's been it's been fascinating. And I think it's cool. I think it's still, it's like you have a piece of your dad with you forever now. Yep. You know? Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, you don't have to burn through the weekend, but you always have something you can go back to and, and, and learn about him and learn a piece about your family right there. So I think it's very cool. Thanks, man. So as we wrap up today's show. Uh, have, how was it for you with your parents growing up? Was it weird? Was it was it mundane? Was it the all American family? We want to know. Hit us up on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. All at the Liquid Carnage. 
Um, fall is in the air. The EP is looking for a Halloween costume to wear in the Denver metro area. Uh, we think he should go as Alan from The Hangover. If you think he should, send your support to him at liquid underscore EP on Twitter and the Instagram. Oh, that's good. That would be awesome. That'd be really funny. I like that. That would be really funny. Oh. I think he should go, he should go, he should go as Alan from The Hangover. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Does he have friends he can go with that will match up? No, I don't know. Okay. Um, if not though, you know what? I'll, I'll take that. I'll, yeah, Janice will probably want to be baby Carlos so make me carry around her Bjorn all night. Yeah, so that's, that's, <laughs> that'd be funny. Yeah, that'd be good. That'd be good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That being said, Jason, take us home. Hey, thanks for listening, everybody. We always appreciate you. That was Scott. I am Jason. And as always, 